As frequent viewers know, one regular feature of our program is a sort of show and tell, where guests bring in something, could be a book, could be a photograph, who knows what. But it's important to them in some way, symbolic of who they are and what they're about. Dr. Ladakis, you've got a couple items for us, and I'm really interested in this, so let's um, take a look. The first item I brought is something that, um, when, I, when I was in middle school and high school, uh, I started doing a Taekwondo, uh, which is a Korean martial art, it's actually an Olympic sport now. And uh, actually, it really helped me a lot, um, uh, the self-discipline, the discipline within the group, the class, uh, the um, focus on actually the spiritual part. It was mostly martial art back then. Uh, I, I remember we had sessions with a master uh, before big exams, and he would actually give us, I mean, he, he gave us you know, instructions and, and advice how to do well in tests. Uh, so it was a very tight group of people. and. I continued for years, even after I, when I went to college, and I, I reached a level, a, a certainly a, a good level is, you know, black belt, second down, and there is a room in the department for years that I did Taekwondo, but no one has seen a proof of that. <laughs> so this is the actual diploma from Pukiwon, which is the Seoul, uh, Korea uh, original place, the Mecca of Taekwondo, and there's my name there and everything, so it's in Korean, so it's true. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, the second uh, item I, I brought uh, is actually a little book. Um, it's just for the name. Uh, this is a, a, a very well-known and respected author in, uh, and philosopher in, in Greece and, and Europe, Nikos Kazajakis. He's from the 50s. He was actually nominated uh, for Nobel Prize in Literature nine times. And in 1957, he almost got it, but he was one vote short of getting it. He uh, at that time, that year, it was Albert Camus who actually uh, got it. And he um, uh, wrote a lot of books about, uh, you know, general, uh, general uh, human condition, um, uh, existentialism, uh, the philosophy of Christianity, Buddhism. Uh, he, um, uh, he, uh, he actually, uh, at some point, he approached, even at that time, uh, uh, Eastern philosophies. And uh, he was even criticized by the um, authorities at that time in the establishment because he was supposed to be, he was considered to be a little bit heretic. Uh, and, uh, he, uh, in one of his uh, books, actually, um, Passion of Christ, um, was, um, uh, was uh, modified as a, as a script and uh, Ma uh, Martin Scorsese uh, actually did a film out of it uh, in 1986, 1988, actually, was nominated for Oscar. So anyway, when I was again in... Uh, in middle school and high school, I, I, I read a lot of these books and from that author. And this is from Saint, it says Saint Francis, which actually refers to uh, Saint Francis of Assisi. It's, this is a fictional biography of the saint, and, uh, and of course, it's not ecclesiastical, you know, text. Uh, it is not really very precise, but it basically talks about humanity and uh, the existential despair of, of man compared to divine. So I used to like that author. Well, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Dr. Patel, what have you brought with you today? Uh, so mine's a little different. Today I brought um, one of my favorite Gettys that a former patient of mine at my last job um, gave to me a, as a parting gift when she found out I was leaving the practice. Um, it has my name on one side, and then the other side says, a truly great doctor is hard to find, difficult to part with, and impossible to forget. And um, she was a patient kind of in her mid-50s. I, I treated her for breast cancer, and, and she did remarkably well. But um, this was a small kind of thank you gesture on her behalf that, that she decided to um, gift me. And she doesn't know it, but this truly has meant a lot to me. Um, I have it in my kitchen cabinet along with my other coffee mugs. And every day when I open up the kitchen cabinet and I see this, this reminds me of what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. Um, I'm sure Peter can relate, but there are days and, and weeks where we've both had awful weeks. And sometimes we kind of sit back and reflect, okay, out of all of the specialties in medicine, why did we choose oncology? Why did we decide to do this? And I think it's a nice little reminder that if we're able to even impact one patient in a positive way every day, then then it's worth it. It's worth it to keep going, and it's worth it to kind of take that reset, start fresh, and go on. Now you mentioned, you know, uh, you're obviously dealing with cancer patients. Um, one of the things that I've come across in talking to different uh, physicians, the surgeons are the ones who always tell me they feel the most comfortable in the OR. 
So the surgical oncologists, the Dr. Sardis and Gushins and so forth, they're happy in the OR. Well, you're not in the OR, so where are you most comfortable? Um, I, in, in the room with the patient and the family and uh, also, you know, um, reading, reading, you know, literature, medical literature, oncology literature, where, where I'm most uncomfortable with is dealing with insurances, as you say that, <laughs> and, and, and bureaucracy and arguing with them about treatments that should be given. And the cost is becoming a major, has become a major issue. And uh, I have to profess I'm not very good in that. I mean, dealing with uh, no insurance agents. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> no the, 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 yeah, the staff knows, yeah, my yeah. colleagues know that. <laughs> so, so. <laughs> So what's, uh, what's the future hold in the battle against cancer? You know, what, what's, what are you excited about? Um, so I think so, so far for me, since I've been a couple of years out, um, everything that's been up and coming in terms of immunotherapy and targeted therapy has certainly been um, exciting. I'm sure Peter can speak to that a little bit more since he's definitely seen the evolution from just chemotherapy to targeted therapy. Um, I think as we continue to find more targeted mutations, um, that continues to remain exciting, but I'm actually see, excited to see what um, AI has to do with this. I think we're reading some data on possible early detection of certain cancers, and I'm interested to see on how that plays out in the long term um, in terms of not just early detection, but um, detecting early recurrence in cancer patients as well. So when you're not in the exam room or dealing with patients and so forth, um, you're obviously outside the hospital at that point. So how do you feel in terms of your work-life balance? Do you think you're where you want to be? Would you like a little more work, a little less work, more life balance? What's your thoughts? Well, uh, go ahead. No, I said half. Oh. <laughs> Well, I think we're both in, in different aspects of our, our life right now, but but for me personally, um, you know, outside of work, my husband and I used to travel quite a bit, um, but we now have a nine-month-old, so he definitely keeps us busy. Um, I think I think here at Mercy, I'm very happy with my job, and I think I have a pretty good work-life balance. I'm able to come home and kind of take off the physician hat and put on the mom hat and, and be at home with my um, husband and son. Um, I think my colleagues also do a great job in, in supporting work-life balance for each other. We're always able to kind of cross cover each other and make sure everybody um, has ample time to relax and so forth. Well, I mean, I'm obviously, you know, biased here, but I, um, um, I, I think practicing oncology is, can be incredibly demanding and, and difficult and, and draining. And I strongly command and they admire Anoki and, you know, uh, uh, women physicians young with young families who try to balance that. It's incredibly difficult. And um, it's true. Um, and uh, because you have to raise your kids at the same time, you know, you put so much uh, um, emotional um, uh, investment and, and time investment and, 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 and physical, actually, um, um, draining, uh, you know, taking care of patients. And uh, on, on my side, I think it's a lifestyle. Um, I, I think on practicing oncology, it's, it becomes part of your life. Uh, and you can do other things, you can have hobbies, you can, but it's not easy for many of us, if not most of us, to totally disconnect, uh, particularly when we have bad outcomes. Uh, you know, many times we go back and think about a case and see whether something could be done, you know, differently. And usually that's not the case, but uh, it, it, is, it becomes part of your life. So yes, I try to go to the gym. Now, when the kids were younger, like with Anoki, uh, you know, 99% of the time outside practicing medicine would go to the kids, you know, and having functions with them and going on trips with them and do all the important things with them. And of course, if I could skip a little bit, find a little time to go to the gym, or that would be a good thing. Now the kids are older, so there is a little bit more free time. But as I said, practicing oncology is not just simply a job. It's part of our life, I, be I believe. You know, a after, calling. After, after all this, it's a call. I think it's a calling, yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I will yeah. say, though, I am fortunate that my husband's very supportive of my career. And, um, you know, despite having a baby, things have not changed in terms of that support. So um, I have that. And then my parents live close by, which is why I ended up back in this area. I, I was raised in Colombia, and so now it's kind of full circle coming back home. So it's been good help. <laughs> well, Drs. Ladakis and Patel, I want to thank you both for your time and your candor. 
And I'm hoping our viewers enjoyed a chance to hear what you had to say, learn a thing or two, maybe something they can apply to their daily lives. And thank you for watching. On behalf of myself, our guests, the Mercy staff, and the Sisters of Mercy, we wish you good health and humor. And until we gather again, may the road rise up to meet you. So you made it all the way through the credits for Wait, Doctor, I Forgot to Ask. This is where we briefly discuss the question each physician wishes their patients would ask but don't, or that most unusual hand-on-the-doorknob question posed by a patient at the end of their visit. Thoughts, doctors? What's that question you wish they would ask but don't, or that maybe out of left field question? The, the question I usually hope that they don't ask right from the first visit is about survival. Uh, because they have limited information, and we, really, you know, we don't want to. And I, I, when the, the, sometimes family members actually ask those questions, and I turn to the patient herself or himself and say, "Are you sure you want to have this kind of discussion?" Because we can now now we can just talk about statistics and, and literature, but we're not really talking about yourself. Uh, I mean, this is pretty much where the range of outcomes that we we move, you know, within. Uh, but you can do much better than the average person according to the statistics. And it would be more helpful and I would be able to have more confidence, you know, going over your prognosis after a few months or several weeks of treatment, at least to see how you uh, interact with the treatment, how you, you progress, you know, and how, how you deal with it. And so in general, I, um, I, I do not encourage uh, patients to, and all family members to bring up a survival and long-term outcome conversation uh, um, unless they really want to from the first visit. I, I guess the one question that sometimes patients don't always ask, but I think it's appropriate when they ask is, um, is it okay to go for a second opinion or a clinical trial? I think some patients sometimes feel hesitant or they may feel that um, they may be um, coming across in a certain way if they asked you that question as their provider, but I don't think it's um, I don't think it's abnormal to ask. I think if you want a second opinion to make sure that um, your provider is treating you appropriately, I think that's appropriate. If they want to go for a clinical trial, we have um, great options with surrounding universities. I think we should definitely utilize those resources. So I certainly encourage patients that if they would like a second opinion or clinical trial, go for it. Doctors, thank you both. Mm -hmm. Thank you.